Okay, hello, I guess we're on. We are 20 people together now. And uh, please let me know if this uh, microphone doesn't work. I have some surprises for you today. And uh, could I, um, perhaps, um, for some reason, I'll, uh, oh, here we go. Yeah, here we go. If you see me, please let me know in the comments field. I would uh, love, and if you hear me, <laughs> it's always fine. Hello, Margo. I uh, have the chat up here. Maybe I should put that. For some reason, my chat is not showing up on the side here like it normally does. Live viewer comments. Oh. But they are here. All good. Video and sound. Thanks a lot. All right. So, um, for some reason, I'm uh, not getting comments up like I normally do here. Uh, but I can see myself there. Oh, there's a lot of light coming down on me. I'll sit back a little bit. And Blade. There we go. Good Sunday, folks. Blade and Remy. Hey, good to see you there. Max also. Wonderful. I'm going to put this up here so I can see you all. Luke, I see you are here. And Keith from Huntington Beach, California. I imagine it's beautiful there. Stig from the north of Norway. I know you like skiing and uh, I have something to show you from uh, from yesterday. And 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 mind you, did you see this photo? Um, oops, I can't have that there. I'll put this here. If you saw this uh, photo that I uh, put up uh, as a uh, banner here, let's see if I can uh, if I can uh, put it up again because it was such a beautiful day here in uh, the place where I uh, where I uh, live. The sunset now and. Uh, Maybe I can, uh, let's see if I can do this. Um, it's been a while. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> I was trying to, <laughs> here we go. And uh, maybe I can show you now. This uh, was the sunset just half an hour ago. And uh, I had to take a photo of it to show you because uh, it's beautiful. This beautiful weather that we're having now, springtime, it's so uh, nice, really, and uh, and enjoyable. And uh, yesterday I was, uh, oh, Keith, you used to live near Tucson, really? Oh, that's cool. Yeah, Dead Cat Bounce, it's, uh, it's nice here now. And uh, I got to tell you, for um, I, I feel very fortunate to be able to live um, in the fjords uh like this with so much nature and not so many people around um i know it's a privilege but of course all my uh, ancestors have uh, lived here so it's no wonder i was born very close by um and uh, as many norwegians have always tried to uh, escape the harsh climate in the winter time and the darkness uh, so too did my uh, great grandfathers three of them actually one wanted to move to iceland and two actually moved to uh, to america to the dakotas and uh well, well somewhere on the east coast and also um well there are several other family members but my grandfather uh, parents my grandfathers the two who went to usa one stayed for five years from 1881 to 1885 actually that's my grandfather and uh, and then they returned back to Norway, and that's that's why I'm here, I guess. Yeah. So uh, I hope you like uh, the sunset. But I was going. What I was going to say is that there's so many mountains around here, and I uh, I've talked about this on the, on this channel, this uh, genetic memory. If you remember the video from uh, from this fall, where I talk about um, when we have so much from these Scandinavian hunter-gatherers, everyone who has some Viking in them, or Germanic tribes, Anglo-Saxons, Franks, Alemanni, Longobards. Um, we have a lot of that um, Scandinavian hunter-gatherer, which originally were two 
um, migrations into Scandinavia, the eastern hunter-gatherers from the north and uh, the western hunter-gatherers from the south, and they mixed, right? And, uh, and uh, when the farmers came, the uh, early European farmers who started mixing with the western hunter-gatherers, and they came up here and they started this, uh, well, well, they weren't able to conquer um, the hunter-gatherers up here, so far north, right? And uh, when the warriors came, the Indo-European Yamnaya, they too had the same problem and, and they, they ended up mixing very much during the Bronze Age. And that's sort of what turned into the Baltic Germanic tribes and Vikings. I spoke about this, uh, if you remember. And, and that's why I talk about uh, genetic memory in a sense, because I'm so connected uh, to nature when I'm in nature. But when I'm in cities and modern life gets to me, I, uh, I feel disconnected somehow. So yesterday I went, um, well, actually on a Friday evening, I uh, had this almost epiphany. I, uh, the stars came up and uh, Orion, which we and uh, many people in Scandinavia still call Figarokin, the goddess uh, Frigg, who would um, spin the lives of uh, everyone alive. So your fate has been spun for you by the Orion's belt, that's the um, rock, we call it, when you spin uh, a thread. And uh, of course, the Vikings weren't afraid to die if they know that their lives had already been spun in a thread, life thread, so to say, by Frigg. And, uh, and when I saw that on Friday coming up in the Pleiades, uh, Seven Sisters, you know, if you saw um, John and I talked about um, these uh, mythologies, the myths, in um, about a month ago here on this channel. Well, for me, um, right over here, which I made a video about, there is this uh, sacred ground for the hunter-gatherers. And um, there we have a lot of rock carvings, uh, lots of uh, fallos and, and vulva, and there was fertility, right? They had some cults there and and just up behind there is a huge mountain which i look at every day and i uh, decided on friday that i need to connect more to nature again and uh, i went up that mountain and i'd like to show you if you want to see that uh, i made a short video for you uh, so i can show you that afterwards if that's okay and i'll read your comments and uh for some reason, I'll uh, I'll see if I'm able to get uh, comments from you. No, I cannot put comments for some reason on uh, on uh, um, this what you're watching now. But I can read them here for you. So, um, I uh, oh Remy, it's been snowing. Yeah, I know. No, it's sort of like uh, not giving up on us, right? Well, it is here uh, this past week. I, uh, every morning I wake up really early now because all the birds are doing what birds do in the, in the springtime. And I, I had the spirit of Oyster over me from, you know, the goddess um, Easter. And I saw um, uh, Tom at, at Survive the Jive. He had a pretty cool video now where he talks about the Maypole celebrations in both Germany and in England um, in regards to Oystra and springtime and the fertility rites of old. And uh, just like they still do very strongly in, in Sweden. Um, but that's on mid Midsummer Night's Eve, right? When we here in Norway burn a lot of fires. In Sweden, they do that on the night of the 1st of May. Uh, and they call it Valborg Night, which we used to do also in Norway. Um, yeah. And uh, and Blade Holner, you got fresh snow today. Oh, that's kind of late for April, I guess. Or maybe not. Um, Brenda, hello. Blackmaster Roshi, nice to see you here. And Alessio from Sicily, good to see you. Great to see every one of you here. I'm so glad. 53 people, actually. And uh, I just wanted to uh, chat with you today. I have gotten some questions and some talk, topics to talk about. And I'd like to update you some, on some news. But if you have something to talk about, 
please post them in the chat and we can discuss together and i'll i'll read it while playing this movie um uh, it's only three four minutes from the hiking trip i did with the skis yesterday sunsets and pina coladas Shulamite. Yeah, and Sutherland, all Scandinavians have ancestors who went to America. So true, so true. And I'm glad that my uh, two grandfathers returned to Norway, or else I don't think I would have uh, become to be, so to say. So that's uh, that's something to think about, I guess. So Mr. Sorpaws, I see you are here also. And Margo, I got some questions for you. I'm coming to them very soon. And... Um, Sakarius so Sut, you're here also. Nice. Good to see you. And Daniel Tumeros. Yeah. Um, and the band, band Found, Margot, he says, has great music. The uh, music video, Walburgis, uh, Walburgis Nacht in German. Oh, that's cool. Let's try and, uh, and uh, look up that afterwards. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to definitely do that. And I, um, I also saw this band, uh, you know, the band Heilung. They have, um, I think, a dancer or something who's always a, also a musician. And she posted a Easter video. I, I made a post about it on uh, Viking Stories on Facebook, I think, and Patreon, and on you, this YouTube channel, uh, where I linked to the music video. That's pretty, um, I guess, awesome stuff for, uh, for spring and fertility celebrations of old. And, uh, oh, and Max, nice to see you. Skål. Skåne. So, uh, yeah, Valdruna, Mike. Yeah, they're really good. And, I, and I'm curious to what they're going to do next. They, um, I'm actually writing a little bit about that. Um, not Valdruna, of course, but, um, uh, you know, Maria, the Norwegian singer in, in Valdruna. She has this costume, and it's a costume from really old times. Um from this, let me see if I can find it here. Um, from this uh, really old and and cool, um, yeah, there we are. The Shaman of Bad uh, Durenberg. I said this wrong last time I mentioned this on this channel, so I'll be sure to make that right. And maybe I can show you. Yeah, I can do that now. I'm getting good control here over. Here we go. Can you see uh, her? She's about 8,000 years old, Western hunter-gatherer, and uh, there we go. And uh, we know uh, a lot about her. Um, uh, the more I write about this in what I'm writing on um, this book called 12,000 Years of uh, Norwegian History, I'll, I'll, I'll try to get it out in English as soon as possible, and we'll call it 12,000 Years of Scandinavian History. What I'm doing in this book, I'm, um, I'm writing about Vikings and, and, and so many archaeologists and uh, historians are now looking at connections further back in larger, broader uh, perspectives, meaning um, what happened in the Bronze Age is relevant for the Viking Age. The fundament, or, or um, yeah, we can say the fundament, the, the whole basis of Vikings and the Viking Age society was shaped in the Bronze Age. That's what the leading archaeologists who have been working with in, in um, Denmark and Sweden are saying now. And uh, I kind of like that. But I go really much further back in time. And I'd like to talk with you a little bit about that now because I have some suggestions. And uh, what I'm doing in this book, because most books I'm, I'm reading, like this one, and this is a giveaway, by the way, uh, David Reich, I met him in Boston at Harvard once, and we had a chat about uh, DNA uh, before I started working with Johannes Krause uh, in some projects that he um, uh, has in Georgia and uh, Kazakhstan. Uh, I'm looking forward to telling you more about that. I can't say anything else, but I got two of these books, and I thought I wanted to give you a... Uh, it's nice to give a, have a giveaway. And I did that last on the last live stream, and, uh, and uh, uh, I shouldn't sign it. Well, maybe I can say hello from from me, can I not? Who we are and how we got here. There we go. And and uh, it's a pretty nice book, well written, I guess. Um, 
but uh, not too updated because it's three years old. And there's so much going on with ancient DNA now. It's really exciting and cool. And what I, what I was wanting to say about this um, book that I'm writing on, when I read these books like this one, or um, let's see, uh, yeah, like uh, Johannes Krause has got this book, A Short History of uh, Humanity. This is really good, actually. Uh, I like his uh, perspective, and uh, there's so much exciting stuff here. But both of these books talk about, um, um, well, Vikings, Iron Age, Bronze Age, and, and uh, going further back in time uh, into the Neolithic times and the Scandinavian hunter-gatherers, the Western hunter-gatherers. But um, they always have this Central European perspective. And what I'm missing is a Scandinavian perspective from the north looking down. And that's what I'm doing in this book, 12,000 years of Scandinavian uh, history, as we will call it in, uh, in English. I hope you like it. And I'll write it from my ancestors' perspectives, like when the Scandinavian hunters, hunter-gatherers have been up here, surviving in this harsh climate, having boats, um, 50 kilometers out at sea to hunt for seal and, and really thriving. Um, but then in the Neolithic times, when the early European farmers started coming into Europe, uh, you saw the first great concentrations of peoples. And, and it came from Anatolia up towards the Balkans. But, but the first place uh, where they were able to set up uh, farming in Europe was on the Hungarian plains and in uh, present-day uh, Bulgaria on the Black Sea coast. And they had some large, large uh, cities there, tens of thousands of peoples. And you had the first, and lots of uh, mythology early on, gold and, and uh, um, copper before bronze. But... There you had the start of class society, you had the first kings, and you had a really, really big difference between poor and, and, and wealthy, and of course wealth came in. And um, for these peoples who lived up north in Scandinavia, and who watched this because they traveled and, and had uh, lots of connections all over, how did they view all this, the spread of farming? Um, coming closer and closer, you know, just like the start of the Viking Age when the Frankish Empire and Charlemagne came closer and closer and they started beheading four and a half thousand people in one day in the town of Herden, the Saxons, Charlemagne did. I, I'm sure you know about this, but of course, uh, and the Saxon king sought ref refuge with the Danish king, of course. And that's when they started uh, the Viking Age, of course, that catapulted. But we can also look at this uh, before the Bronze Age, I mean, before the Nordic Bronze Age, we started later, and see how did these Scandinavian hunter-gatherers view what was going on? Because the Neolithic farmers, you know, they uh, were able to, um, they took the land and made them owners of land. Ownership came in, right? And they took animals and were, were pastoralists or, or herders and, and enslaved them. They enslaved the earth, they enslaved uh, animals, they enslaved people. Uh, and they even had human sacrifices and even cannibalistic rites, these ne ne Neolithic farmers. And they came closer and closer further up north, mixing with uh, Western hunter gatherers, mostly women. And, and how did they look at this, you know? And that's what I'm writing on about in this book, you know? Uh, and also in the when the Yamnaya warriors came and this, what we call the battle axe culture, the corded bear culture. I'm writing about this as well. And I see so many parallels going all the way up to the Viking Age. So I hope you'll enjoy this book. Uh, it'll come out in the region in August. And I was wanting to show with the cover actually, but I, I can't do that yet. So I'm gonna have to do it in a later live stream. Or maybe I can do it on my Patreon channel. Yeah, I can do that, actually. Yeah, I know a lot of you are on the Patreon here. So um, let me just, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to just read through a, a few comments now. Um, 
I've told you about the book now, okay? I'm going to show you the video. I hope it's okay and that you want to see it. While I show this short video to you, I'll uh, I'll read through the comments and see if I if any of you have some questions for me on the topics you want to talk about. Um, because I've talked a lot now for 21 minutes, but maybe we can um, have a chat going back and forth a little bit. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to um, open this uh, video file um, of uh, yesterday's hiking trip, going skiing up this mountain that I got just up here. If you'll just excuse me now, I'm going to pause it here. <laughs> See if you can. I hope you're being patient with me now. I'm supposed to be able to share my screen here. And uh, yes, this works out perfectly, I think. Let's see now, I'll do a full screen here and uh, and I'll wait a little bit. Here we go. And um, while you watch this, I hope you enjoy. It's only, let's see how many minutes, uh, 3.47. Uh, with sound and I put in some music there, Margot, just so you know. Um, this was my experience yesterday, where I needed to go out into the nature and uh, and really feel, well, do what I like the most, to be up in the mountains. And I saw so many tracks of the deer along the path that I walked. So I'll show you some of that too. So bear with me, hear this. Oh, and if there's no sound, let me know. No sound. Thanks, Margo. I'll fix that. Sorry. No sound. What do you know? All right. We're going to fix this because I have a backup solution. I can play this from... Uh, uh, here we go. I can play this from... Um, um, Google Disk. So we'll try it once again. And I'll... Uh, Let's see now, present, and we'll do the, um, maybe I should just, uh, here we go, the sound is there, and here we go. I think you'll see, be able to see it now, is that right? And uh, Margo, if it doesn't work now, please, let me know. Tormund, Tormund, I saw you too. Let's see if it works another time. Um, this is my backup solution. Should work now, so let's try. Well, that went well. Oh, the snow is perfect. I can't wait to ski down here. And now it's just me and the deer. And uh, not that, from what I can see, not that far in front of me actually. So let's, let's see if I can see some, some deer up here in the mountains. That'd be cool. All right. Let's see how this goes. I'm going up there on that ridge across, and then there's a shoulder going up there to the top. And I gotta be careful not to be too close to the mountainside. So that should work. I got my skin on, so it's all enjoyment from here on up, I think. Oh man, it's so beautiful to be up here. I'm at uh, 615 meters, 615, so I got 350 left to go up there. I just need to find a way to zigzag my way through there and uh, then it's no bother. And uh, going down here, we call it slush. I'm sure it's the same expression in English too. Oh, that's going to be good. Looking forward to that. Look at this. 
What met me when I came up here just now, I just had to record it for you. Here's the Atlantic Ocean meeting in the Norwegian Sea about straight ahead is the mountain Skola. I've been there. And this is the Twin Mountain. That's the other one a bit lower down. And my town of Fluir is back there. Hey, so I'm uh, finally on the top here now. Looking at my town down there and looking down. Yeah, I can't even see where my tracks are. Oh, yeah, far down there. That's where I'll be in about 30 minutes. <laughs> three hours, three and a half hours up and 30 minutes down. you can uh, hear me fine again now this was uh, the video I wanted to show you and uh, I see that we're back now thanks for all the good comments did you like it super Margot thanks and yes awesome yeah and, uh, and and truly it was great um, and, and yes I agree uh, po uh, polar Oracle so little snow i see you riding there and and yes this was one of the last trips we could do up there um i wanted to go on the um, the other face towards here uh because it's much steeper to ski down uh but i saw on on friday um during sunset actually that there was uh, too little snow and uh, so i decided to go up on the east side and luckily there was enough snow but i had to walk with my skis on my uh, uh, backpack for about an hour and and to let's see who said uh, uh Söderlund, it was not my underwear no no i, I was wearing shorts you see <laughs> but uh to be out in the nature and and the skiing in shorts and and, and shirt uh, only uh and no wind it's just amazing whenever you can do that um and Margot, yeah, the, the contrast, uh, I mean, it was, I feel sort of alive when I'm out there, Margot. Uh, and and um, I, 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 thought, I think, I was thinking about this yesterday also, about this genetic memory thing, because I feel so much more connected and balanced and, and full when I'm out in nature. Uh, it's, it's like everything is uh, connecting from here to everything around. And, and um, uh, you know, the Scandinavian hunter-gatherers, they used to hunt up north of here on this place called Snøegga. Um, it's a mountain on Sundmøre at 1,500 meters. And and uh, Black Master Roshi, you ask how high I was yesterday. It was only close to 1,000 meters, not, not that high. On Sundmøre, you go higher, but 1,500, 1,600 meters, sometimes 18. And, and I think there are three mountains there that are close to 2,000 meters. Um, and I've been on several up there because I have so much, uh, my, my clan is from there. Um, but um, it's, it's more or less um, when I, uh, when you know that the Scandinavian hunter-gatherers hunted for reindeer who went as high as 1,500, more than 1,500 meters, and they were up there uh, in, in the small building shelters hiding from the, from the, um, uh, reindeer waiting for them to come and they found our arrows up there and the places where they would uh, uh, stay and I'm, I'm thinking for me it's instinct 
to be able to run. If you saw the first video on this channel, by the way, uh, I talk about this because I go, when it, there's just too much of modern life, modern society, social media, uh, cities, too many people, I, uh, I really like to escape out into um, forests or mountains and, and uh, to find that tranquility. And that's what I did yesterday, yeah, what I showed you a little bit of now. And um, and uh, and uh, Sakarius so, said, so "You said those are mountains. Yeah, nothing like uh, carves a landscape like glaciers do. And, and yeah, uh, but it's 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 still. I mean, it looks tremendous. This this mountain, it really does. Uh, but it's not that high, uh, really. So uh, I prefer the mountains when they're a little bit higher." Uh, because then you can see um, several glaciers in, in different directions. So up on Sundmöre, where, where I've done a lot of hiking, or like Stig, you're watching now, you live up north in Norway, where uh, the Jotunheimer uh, was at one of these glaciers, and there are several glaciers up there, and uh, the, the view and um, the peace with nature, and one with nature, it's just amazing to be out there and i think for me it's instinct to even to run and and, and just be in nature um and that's probably why i like cross-country skiing so much because i just race through the forest and just uh i think it's something that we used to do a lot for thousands of years all of our ancestors when they were hunting running for days on and um after the year they had uh put an arrow in and just following them until they could uh, pick it, pick them up or I don't know. Well, however they were hunting. So yeah, I hope you, I hope you, I, oh yeah, I see a lot of, a lot of you like that. So thanks a lot. Yeah. Uh, almost like a uh, uh, Falsham. Yeah. <laughs> almost like a parachute. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's this camera. It's a 360 camera. Um, I kind of like this, uh, but uh, I don't know. It's uh, I could have done, better probably but uh, it's enough for me to to take care of the moment that i uh, that i felt there and mr so pause it really looked nice yeah and it was that so um and 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 uh block the lighter um yeah about that visiting norway i'm still planning to do something about that because uh, i had some great plans um uh, last year with um Bjorn Andreas Bull Hansen, we wanted to invite a lot of people to come over to Norway. It didn't turn out. We were this close to making it happen. So uh, I'm going to try again. So maybe we can arrange for something so we can meet. I'd, I'd like that very much to invite you to Norway. Life in nature is good, Mon Coco. Yeah, I agree so much. And Philip, nice to see you here. You don't have a smartphone anymore? Oh, and because of that, you're a lot happier. Wow, that's good to hear. I'm glad. And... Uh, I know your father, I'm sure he's glad for that too. So um, genetic memory, Margot, has to be real. How else can you explain a feeling of instant belonging to places and the love of interests and hobbies? And um, uh, you know, I have this thing when uh, I'm running in forest, especially with dogs. You know, you take your dog for a walk, but you can take your dog for a run, right? And, and I have this thing, I mean, I communicate so well with uh, dogs, especially when we're out in the forest and running. And, and I've been, of course, um, hunting a bit also with, uh, with dogs. And uh, wow, that's something that's written in. And, and the dog and I, wow, we connect. That's instinct, Margot. And, uh, and uh, it has to be real. I agree totally. Yeah. Um, Oh yeah, Midnight Caller, uh, four dead this week by avalanches up north in Norway. Yeah, actually it's been a really bad week and I thought about that yesterday because I was alone and I normally don't go um, on these trips up in the steep um, mountains. Uh, I always have people with me. I have my, uh, um, this, um, if you're caught by a glacier, you can find each other. If someone survives or not caught, it's this uh, beep beep uh, thing. I don't know what, you, what, it's, what it's called in English. Uh, so I'm, I always do that. Uh, but here there are no glaciers because the mountains aren't spe steep enough. Uh, on Sundmöre, where my clan is from, uh, there uh, we have to wait until this time around. 
January or February, you shouldn't go out uh, skiing in the, the because then there's too many avalanches. And up north in Norway, uh, some of those people who have been uh, caught by glaciers and have died uh, are uh, foreigners, actually, who are, have been there as tourists who don't know how dangerous it is, I guess. And, uh, and we see that every year, uh, people coming up from Czech Republic, for example, to go uh, down the rivers um, or some kind of uh, wildlife experience. And it's... <laughs> It's 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 crazy how difficult it, and how much respect you need to have for nature, not just jump into it. And I see so much stupidity, unfortunately, uh, by people who go out. There was one guy who was caught a month ago, I think, and he went out to a place you shouldn't go. Everyone knows that, you know, and uh, for some reason he didn't know that. But um, yeah, yeah, it's probably better if you live in that nature when you go out there. Uh, but running in the mountains is the best feeling, Stig. I agree. I agree. And uh, and uh, let's see now. Uh, Chris, skiing in the mountains is fun. Screw running. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, all right. Um, let's see now. I was wanting to ask you something here now. There's so many people watching now, and I'm happy to see all, all of you. And there are uh, questions here also. Söderlund, you have a Yemptun. Oh, that's probably a really nice dog. Wow, that's cool. And Odin, you're saying genetic memory and taste and smell is also pretty strong, I believe. Yeah, the way we can taste or smell that something is inedible, for example. Oh, yeah. And I talked about this in my genetic me memory video here on this YouTube channel where I mentioned, uh, and I, I think I put a link also about this research they did on mice in terms of smell and taste because that's really... I think underestimated by a lot of people how uh, different smells can invoke fear. Uh, and, and they found on mice that if you have a mouse uh, who is um, smelling something that has never been exposed to before, but three generations back, uh, a mouse, this great grandfather, I guess, of the mouse, uh, uh, have connected that smell with fear still three generations later that's stored and the mouse reacts to it and that's amazing uh in this study i read because uh, of course you know it's uh but um uh, it's it's always amazing to me to get these confirmations because i really feel there's something there and from after i posted that video i've gotten so much feedback from so many of you and and others and and uh, I'm just overwhelmed by so many people who can connect to that, and and uh, I I hope you really enjoy that. Hey, do you like the T-shirt? By the way, I made this uh, T-shirt for myself after um, uh, this court case uh, with uh, Johnny Depp last year. He was called one eye by his mother. There's this YouTube clip of him talking about his upbringing, Johnny Depp, that is, and and he told uh, well the whole world how he was um his mother didn't treat him that well and called him one eye because he didn't couldn't see on the other one eye and i thought is that something negative uh and i i made this uh, t-shirt after that and uh, i i shouldn't even show this but on the back here it says washed up uh yeah something about being a bad dad and i can sort of um from my own life and experience, I can uh, relate to how it is to be, um, to have, uh, let me rephrase this in the best possible way. Uh, I can relate to wanting to be a, uh, a father, but uh, maybe for some reason, you're not able to um, be, uh, well, have custody, for example. And that can be a battle, especially in uh, in uh, a country where you're supposed to have equality and and uh, all the liberties in a, in a free country, but uh, not always as a father actually um, in the courts, for example. So I was kind of captivated by that whole uh, court case last year, and, and I made this T-shirt here um, uh, for myself, and and uh, and uh, I think one eye is a pretty good call. Hi, Life Arna. So nice of you to give me a little um, 
piece of uh, of money here. I wish I could put it on here. For some reason, that didn't work today. And I saw also another one, uh, uh, Michael Dishman. Thanks a lot. I, I really enjoy that. And and regarding that, I um, have uh, something for you now. You see, a lot of you who are watching this are are on. Um, my patron page also where i put in a lot of extra stuff this uh skiing video i put up there today uh, so so i put on a little bit behind the scenes and talk about my life a little bit and i have some really cool stories from my uh well well um some of these stories that i've experienced while while being on these expeditions scientific expeditions are are pretty uh crazy i've been accused of being a liar <laughs> just because I tell the stories like they are, but it seems so crazy. And that's on the Patreon channel. So I have a little extra there for those of you who, who, who don't know uh, about that. And and I did something. Uh, somebody told me I should do this. So first off, um, let's see if this comes up, if I'm able to. Uh... Oh, YouTube doesn't support comments on private videos. Well, oh, now I know. What, uh, what what is the problem? So all right, so maybe I can just uh, do um, this. Let's see if that works. And uh, here we go. Um, that's my um, uh, patron channel for those of you who don't know that. And um, equality in court, definitely joking. <laughs> yeah, David. <laughs> Boy, I could make. Um, um, yeah, I, I should write something on that. I'm, I'm not going <laughs> to say anything more than that. Uh, but, you know, uh, you grow in life, and I think you need to have... Uh, I think it was um, Carl Jung who said, uh, uh, beware of um, unearned wisdom. And he was talking about psychedelia. And, and uh, Odin hanging on the tree for nine days, being more dead than alive and his quest for wisdom and, uh, and knowledge. Uh, it's really a lot of talk and writing and myths about uh, going into trance to learn more or, or, or get more knowledge. Uh, it's really cool to, uh, with this uh, shamanistic past that, that even the seers in the Viking Age uh, was so important to so many people. And um and i i uh, i think um um this is something that uh, i'm sure a lot of uh, you can relate to but uh there are no shortcuts to to growth or knowledge and the best knowledge i feel is the one you have earned and if it's through a lot of hard hard uh, hardships and through a lot of uh, going uphill uh, if you come out stronger, you come out a better man or woman, and uh, and that's uh, I think that's something what Carl Jung meant about uh, unearned, uh, beware of unearned wisdom, and and I know Jordan Peterson has talked a lot about that. Joe Rogan also I I've seen, and, and uh, well they talk about psychedelia, but the thing is there are no shortcuts, right? And and that's the one thing everyone should be aware of. You know you got to experience things in life and. Learn how to tackle them. I guess that's it. And and in that remark, I was wanting to show you um, another. Um, I have this. Uh, for those of you who want to donate, I'm very very grateful. Uh, and um, someone told me I should um, put up a uh, buy me a coffee. So I've done that now on uh, on uh, buymeacoffee.com/slash Viking Stories, and uh, I've written buy me a beer or an ale. Earl, as we say. Uh, but if you want to do that, thanks a lot. I'll be very happy because um, I also wanted to give you an update on uh, how it's going in life, on the research side and everything. And I, as many of you know, I've been basically a little bit shut out of academia in Norway because of this conflict in uh, Copenhagen with the big Viking paper that I was co-author on. And um, for some reason, that has... Um, followed me to Norway. I didn't think it would do that, but it's really hard to earn a living uh, working with um, scientific projects or uh, with DNA uh, if you can't have a job 
uh, with income, for example, at a university or, or somehow. And uh, that has kind of been a little bit annoying uh, to me, uh, part of that uphill battle for the past three years, and it continues to follow me. So I'm, uh, I wanted to ask you now if you, um, I have this option of uh, talking with some Danes, some nice Danes, I, I like Danes, but there are some Danes who are uh, making this documentary and they wanted to talk uh, about ancient DNA and they wanted to talk to me about uh, cancel culture. And do you think I should uh, go to Denmark and uh, talk about what happened? three, three and a half years ago with uh, me being cancelled for being on Survive the Drive uh, and talking about the Viking paper. I I feel I uh, don't have too much to lose. And, uh, and you know, it's, uh, it's, it's an interesting, uh, interesting story. It's, it's um, I think it's important to tell that story because uh, one should be aware of that. I think the tide is turning a little bit about this uh, craziness that we've seen with people calling around to employers and, and collaborators in projects and everything and wanting to really destroy your whole income and life and, and, uh, and career. Um, it's not nice at all. And uh, two weeks ago, I think, one and a half weeks ago, I was in Oslo at this um, really nice uh, evening, which was dedicated to cancel culture. And uh, I was one of those who were invited there. And we talked about, and I was the only one who had been cancelled there, actually. But there were some some really um, strong and good uh, and smart men and women around this table. We were sitting around, and lots of people were listening, and and we had a really nice talk. And and uh, and we talked about, you know, is it going the right way now? Uh, are things getting better, or do things have to get a little bit worse for it to get better? I don't know. What do you think? But. Um, it was, uh, it's nice to be invited to talk about these experiences. And I try to um, not sound like a bitter or grumpy old man or anything like that. You know, it's just, it's really, really peculiar with these people, who, different persons who want to destroy your livelihood in that sense. So with that said, thanks a lot, Blade Holner, for, uh, for buying me a, a beer and coffee, it says there. Oh, that's good. And Margo, contented for Mjörd, you're writing. Mjörd, that's the Viking beer, right? So uh, I can have uh, one of these also. Thanks a lot. So, so yeah, thanks. And and let me just, before we get into some of the questions here, I'm just checking the time here now, um, because we had some questions from uh, people up front for this live stream, and I wanted to show you some of these uh, news about Vikings, and that's coming up now. Uh, but first off, I just wanted to say here um, from um, Frank, your T-shirt sounds no looks like Strömkarlen in Trollhätten. <laughs> that's yeah, that's pretty funny. Um, Alessio, uh, those people in the ancient time fighting against this kind of weather or wars. Yeah, okay. Oh yeah, I see, I see. And you were in Öland, close to the North Sea, freezing cold. Very Alessio. I mean, I mean, uh, oh, that's that's pretty. That's pretty cool. I guess you felt the instinct there then, uh, and uh, the genetic memory, I hope, from the north. You're a Norman and uh, maybe even some Lombard in you, uh, coming from Sicily. And the uh, green-eyed lady, hi, Sterla. There seems to be some disagreement about how tall the Vikings actually were. What do you think? Well, um, I had a really nice discussion uh, two days ago with a really smart guy who talked about this height thing, because like in Norway, if you see 100 years ago, uh, people were uh, close to, what well, was it, 15 centimeters, men, uh, shorter than today. And and you would think when you know that uh, height, it's controlled by many, many genes, uh, DNA-wise, right? But uh, um, it's, uh, eighty percent DNA, and the rest is is how you eat and the culture, environment you grow up in, and, and that kind of stuff. But um, before one hundred years ago, for example, um, there were so many diseases that would stop growth while you were growing up, 
and and uh, and that's the thing every anywhere before in history before we knew about bacteria um where there have been huge concentrations of peoples it was normal for everyone to get all these uh like you do every fall you get the flu um it was normal in in rome 2000 years ago this famous doctor in norway wrote a really good book about this said you know people weren't taller than 150 centimeters and that's, that's a really really short <laughs> the average height in in rome 150 maybe 155 centimeters the roman soldier 160 they tried to raise it to 165 centimeters uh and imagine the scandinavians coming down who didn't live in cities right like they didn't the germanic tribes didn't do that um of course they didn't have that this this problem that would uh hinder growth in your routines for example so and that's the thing um with vikings also that you had uh, also people who didn't live in cities like the franks started doing um so, so just because of cities and concentrations of peoples um just there you had a, a big height difference with lots of other people so and uh but uh we have found vikings who 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 were tall and and i'm working with this polish archaeologist to do a lot of research uh on sicily on norman um excavations and and uh, and they're called the hulk skeletons i think it's a little bit misleading but uh i looked at this one skeleton uh, when i was in sicily last time i met you alessio um and and i looked at these skeletons with this uh really um smart um paleontologist is that how you said or uh, when you know about skeletons and he said well he probably wasn't two meters but he was more than six feet uh tall uh 1000 years ago and that that was huge especially when you know that these people they were if you know the the battle of um oh my what's that battle again uh, there were two huge battles where so many people uh, attacked of the the muslims the emirate who controlled sicily would attack with um, more than thirty thousand people they would attack 300 knights at uh on on horses chivalry right and they had 150 foot soldiers also and and they would win against thirty thousand people more than thirty thousand people you know the battle of uh Oh, I'm going to try to remember that, but that, I mean, it's just crazy to think of, but these were huge also. And we know in the Bronze Age, you know, the Hyperboreans, they talk about the people from the north who would um, come to Greece, uh, Mycenaean Greece in the late Bronze Age from the north. Maidens would come down to celebrate um, uh, goddesses, fertility goddesses in, in ancient Greece ancient ancient greece right uh, and 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 they, they would be tall um and there were so many stories about this and uh, to me there's no question in mind hyperborea uh, was definitely scandinavia uh when you talk about they talk about the antler from 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 uh, from um reindeer because it's a female um a antler from a female uh reindeer and and the female reindeer is the only um deer type who have antlers actually so and that's and and they talk about uh, the arctic circle and the day and night switching only once a year it's got to be that up and and they were tall and talk about how it's just really really interesting because it's in the viking age before the viking age sort of they went down there not just uh, for the temples and the fertility rites um but um and the seeress in the, even in the Bronze Age went down there, but in the Germanic tribes also, you know about seeresses who went down even to Egypt in the Roman times, um, coming up from the north about shamanism, right? And, uh, but we know a lot of mercenaries also went down to ancient Greece. So it's a really interesting story there coming out. So that's on on, on height a little bit. And and uh, block either uh, you like uh, you talk about uh, the Battle of Teutoburg Forest. Oh yeah, um, just Im imagine like you write that Roman legionaries who were one fifty five centimeters on average, or maybe one sixty or sixty five. I don't know. But this was the year was it nine year nine I think, and the Germans, the Germanic tribes who fought against them were 
175 centimeters on average. Yeah, and I think you definitely had some uh, warriors there who were 185 or 190 or even taller. I'm, I'm, I'm sure you, you had to have that um, because they ate. Uh, we know they had a very good diet and they didn't have that. Uh, well, cities basically. So, so it must have been a huge difference. And I wish in that uh, Netflix series, Barbaren, German made, I talked about this in my troll video here on this channel. And I, I have to admit, I haven't even seen more than half uh, of the first episode of season two. I mean, it's, 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 it doesn't really sit well with me, even though I. It's much better than the Vikings TV show, I think, but still, I haven't even seen that because it's at least they should get the height right. You know, it's so much more immense, like you write about there. Battle of Cerami. Thanks, Max. The Battle of Cerami with C. Karami, Cerami. That was the battle I was thinking about. And there was another battle also a few years earlier uh, or later. Yeah. And James, hey, good to see you, my brother. You're late, but um, you've been playing hockey all day. Oh, oh, that's that's something. You can go to my Patreon channel and check out the the, the video from what I did yesterday. I've already shown it up here. And uh, and David Walker, you're saying if you're looking for topics to dwell into, uh, more on the Hiberian Norse would be good from Ireland to Scotland and all the Isles in between. And definitely, I want to dive into that. Um, there's a problem now, David. I see that in everyone who's uh, writing papers, new studies, and publications about the Viking Age. They're using this big Viking paper, which I was a co-author of, of, which I criticized because they didn't find anything about Norwegian Vikings coming from the Western Fjords, here where I live, to Scotland. It's so short. I've sailed here myself. You know, you leave. Uh, in the morning and in the next afternoon, the next day, you're there in Scotland. And, and it's, it's it's like a highway from here. Uh, and, and we know how much they sail there. But the thing is, in this big Viking paper with 442 skeletons, there were no skeletons between Trondheim along the western coast and all the way to Oslo. Not one. And of course, you can't say anything about the Hibernian Norse or uh, even in Liverpool. Uh, and 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 uh, is it ca ca well north of Liverpool, anyways, um, and the Viral. Uh, you, I mean, we know there was a lot of mix. We know the um, uh, sources, the the um, sources at the time even wrote about this mixing of races of the clans because the clan culture of the of the Gaelic and the and the Vikings were so similar, of course they were, and and um, uh, we know they mixed so much they were called um, Gaelic Norse uh, in contemporary sources. Even you know that's crazy to think about. And what I'm wondering about a little bit now, and we're trying to find that out, could have been, is it possible that um, because of all the tin in Cornwall in the Bronze Age, even that. Um, with all that we had to trade with the sea mammals and the amber and the, lots of other stuff here in uh, Scandinavia, could it be that uh, some of these um, early Vikings, I guess, in the in the Bronze Age would find their way down through Scotland and go that direction? Because we do see when the Yamnaya warriors came, there's an interesting study from the Orkney Isles. They see migration going north, but it's women. It's really weird. And the women have Yamnaya in them, but they're uh, escaping from, from the, I guess, uh, uh, plague or, or genocide or whatever was going on when 90% of the British population disappeared when the warriors came. Uh, but, but there's something going on there. And, and because of the tin that you needed to mix with copper in the alloy, um, like if you saw that, <laughs> um, if you remember from the uh, first season of that great um, Lord of the Rings TV show, and I'm saying great like this, uh, where uh, suddenly they learn about how to make uh, alloy and mix different in the mythology. These elves who have lived for thousands of years and are not smarter than that, they didn't know about that. Oh. 
Do you remember that? <laughs> it was so annoying to see that. Well, anyways, uh, hey, Mad Drug Viking, it's nice to see you there. So, so um, uh, I'll answer some questions here now and, and, and dive into some of these topics so we can uh, uh, do that. And from time to time, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about uh, the Patreon channel where I put up the video if you want to see uh, the hiking trip and then course all the videos and stuff i've got up there and for those of you who have bought me a coffee uh thanks a lot this is all new i'm trying it out today so i'm i'm, uh, I'm happy for everyone who's just done that and and um uh let's see now uh uh max you're saying something smart here now we need the blondness uh and, and the height yeah well that's a good thing uh johannes kraus uh, discusses this in in this book actually because you would think why would up north where it's cold why would people be tall and large shouldn't you be the opposite um many people are thinking that because you want to conserve energy right but what, what johannes is writing here on the why there was selection on uh long legs is because you had to travel much farther to get the game, to get the food, to save your tribe, to survive. And that's why you had selection on, on the leg length. And that's why you had the uh, taller people up north in the cold. And of course, as you say, Max, with the, with the, with the fair skin, um, there are not too many genes uh, deciding that. And the Easter hunter-gatherers had a lot of that. Uh, we know, and the Yamnai, of course, had a lot of Easter hunt gathered in them, so they had that also, but the farmers also had a little bit of that. The thing is, up north, it's all about the lack of the sun, because half of Norway, sort of, is in the Arctic. Very little sun. Above the polar circle, the sun disappears, right? And that's all about D vitamin. So, of course, it's natural selection in a way. If you don't have that fair skin, you'll die, unless you take vitamins, I guess uh but you know of course it's it's no big deal uh and that's uh what you're talking about here the curse the potato Jordan. I, i'm not sure uh what that topic is on but, <laughs> but anyways um uh let's see someone is talking about world war ii here uh that's not viking uh so so i'll skip that but Surla, you said the dogmatic stance some genetic uh, genealogists take on my dna uh, because we have early medieval Danish and Saxon skeletons with what was traditionally called Celtic Y-DNA. Oh, yeah. Um, what I think about that, the dogmatic stance, um, I remember when I was uh, much younger and, and, and got into the DNA bit, it was really cool with all the Y-DNA and the, and the warriors, and I was taking my DNA test to see, oh, am I in straight paternal line, uh, Yamnaya or in the Europeans, as we call them, the warriors, and, and then and then I suddenly was I won, and I wasn't even Easter hunter gatherer. <laughs> uh, but I mean, that's how people view viewed it, and some scholars I even see uh, are viewing it uh, still this way. They're so focused on the Y DNA and trying to make connections, but um, it's it's really really outdated. I feel autosomal DNA is so much more interesting to talk about, or the empty DNA. Like I, I uh, in this book I'm writing on, I, I talk about this paper, and, I, and if you want to, I can send you links and stuff. You can just write to me, uh, my Patreon channel, for example. But I read this really interesting paper on Gothic women. So they, they've they've done a lot of research on Goths in in Poland and some other places. Uh, finding strong genetic connection to, to, to Scandinavia, um, of course, and Gots, um, but, but even more, they, when they researched the empty DNA, meaning the, 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 the feminine uh, heritage, they find a strong genetic um, similarity to the women in the Bronze Age. And even further back in time to not, the, I, mean, I mean, now we're talking the, the women who the Yamnaya warriors found because they were mostly men who came regarding the Y chromosome, right? And, and uh, the thing is, we find strong genetic connections even to the, um, before the Corded Bear, uh, when this Funnelbeke culture who, who did farming before the warriors came, they also took uh, or 
had or had offspring with the with the, the women locally who were Scandinavian hunter gatherers. And this culture, like Johannes Krause talks about, he said it was a very innovative culture, the funnel beakers. And they started spreading southwards, even bringing the first innovation from, um, let's see, oh, nice from uh, Johannes here. Uh, I'm not, well, I, I, I'm not gonna even, find it and read it, I'm just going to tell you. He calls it Swedish tractors, the first invasion, uh, sort of, I, I said in, in invasion, but innovation, the first um, invention, I meant to say, that uh, Scandinavians uh, did, connecting the, the plow with uh, with oxes and, and, and doing it in a new way. That was the funnel beaker invention, which enabled them to, to um, expand southwards when the climate got better to uh, to do farming and no, the verse up north so they had to expand and they had to take over cultures further down south and uh, um, that was sort of like the first invention and gift from scandinavia to <laughs> um to, to europe he writes the thing is the empty dna is has they, they find strong similarities genetic similarities from the gothic women to the yamnaya women to the funnel beaker women, to the Scandinavian hunter gatherers, and that's pretty cool. Uh, so we see all these new stuff now, looking on different sides, and 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 uh, looking at uh, instead of just uh, focusing on the men and the warrior stories and everything, it's really really cool to see. You know, think about it. Women they they used to live longer, right? They still do, of course. And and uh, uh, to remember all this myths and mythologies and the tales in a strong orally um centered culture i uh, and and the shamanist uh, who were a lot of them were women right and the seers um of course uh there is something more than just genetic genetically that we can find and and with words and uh, memories and myths and and that's probably why uh, the god Njord was really the goddess Nathus in the, in the, the Fenwick culture, uh, or or the Vani, the the acid and Vani war, right? Uh, among the farmers, it was a farmer uh, fertility goddess that was during the Iron Age turned into a a Njord, a, a it was a very strong masculine culture. So that's pretty cool. All these new things that is coming out now, and I saw this new D. Um, uh, TV show uh, that came out a month ago or two months ago in Denmark, where this Danish historian uh, goes out and talks with a lot of people I work with actually in Denmark who are quite good, and and they talk about this Nathus and 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 drags every they're searching for Odin, right? And they, they they drag it back to the Bronze Age and through the Iron Age, and they end up with guess what? Lotte Hedag is an archaeologist. I worked with her. Uh, and she has this theory that Odin is rather new, uh, only two, three centuries before the Viking Age, when Attila and the uh, Huns had lost, and and the Germanic warriors were taking over the Roman Empire. Um, a lot of the Huns would settle in southern Sweden. That's her hypothesis, and that's sort of like uh, what they're searching for in this TV show. Also, is Attila and Odin, really the same person. And then there was another Odin figure, of course, going much further back in time, but it's sort of like mixed because of the Fimbul winter and, and, the, and the plague that happened in the uh, sixth and seventh centuries that sort of like messed everything up in terms of remembering when the language changed. And it's worth a watch, um, but I guess you gotta know Scandinavian. I don't think it's been dubbed. I can find that out actually if you want to know. So yeah, um, I'll go on. I hope that was interesting to your questions, uh, Sula. And and um, and and, and uh, Trimbaki von Elsass. I wonder how tall the recent Scots found in southeast Poland are. A big DNA paper. We're supposed to come. That's actually really really interesting so so let's let's wait for that 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 would be really really cool and and um 
The hunters were longer, Sutherland. Yeah, I talked about that now. And they, they found females that were 180 centimeters tall. I, yeah, I think, I didn't know that was a female, by the way, but uh, they have found some, yeah. And um, let's see. Uh, Lady Liberty, nice to see you here. So beautiful, really. Thanks. And and uh, you have that Scottish family going back to Scotland from uh, from USA, yeah. And I'm sure you got a lot of liking and maybe, go, maybe going back to the Bronze Age and... Uh, and perhaps even before, uh, that there were some connections between, well, Norway here and over there. It's three times longer than the distance from southern Norway to Denmark. Is it possible that we were able to cross seas at that time? I mean, it's not far. I've saved there, so yeah. Uh, um, and, and Alessio, I'm glad you can totally feel the feelings like you go hiking, like you talked about. And... Um, and Odin, Valhalla, Eklef, you talk about that. The first piece of evidence that Odin was worshipped as early as the 5th century. Yeah, that was a big news story, right, last month. And, and uh, yeah, I was thinking when I saw that, that oh, these, uh, the, I feel that they're shaping, they're sort of like they want Odin and Attila to be the same person. That's, that, 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 it was sort of like framed almost that way. And, and almost like wishful thinking, because the Odin cult, uh, the Odin figure, um, like I talked to the John White from Crescent Ford in my previous live stream with him, uh, of course, goes much further back in time. But there could be an Odin cult that's, I mean, it's a hypothesis, that, that could be from uh, worshipping Attila. Attila is a Gothic name, right? And the Goths would mix with uh, the Huns, you know, the Huns had this, um, they would tie up their heads on the babies so they get abnormal shape, right? Uh, and the Goths and Gepids would do that also, learning it from mixing, I guess, with the, with the Goths. So, so something had, had definitely been gone, going on there down towards, well, present day Ukraine. Um, so yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's rather interesting, absolutely. Uh, Mad Drunk Viking, did you know that all the historic and archaeological archaeologic advisor quit for Barbaran 2 after they read the script? No, I didn't know that. Barbaran 2, the second season of the TV show on Netflix, Barbaran, they read the script and they quit. Well, that makes sense because I quit also halfway into the first episode. <laughs> I still have it. I mean, I, I, I maybe I will see it. Oh, let me, let me hide that away. I don't need that. Um, and Norwegians... Squeezed cloud, you say. Norwegians are the people today with the highest step ancestry. And yeah, that's actually quite interesting to think about. And I used to wonder a lot about that before I knew what I know now. Uh, and that's that uh, Eastern hunter-gatherers is sort of like the clue there. And the R1B, I guess, if you want to talk why DNA. And uh, because the Yamnaya warriors had a lot of that in them. And you know, before that, you had the ancient North Eurasian called Ana. And, and and everyone came from that, both the Yamnaya and the uh, Eastern hunter-gatherers and the Scandinavian hunter-gatherers. So there's something called uh, canalization in in uh, Squeeze Cloud. I am talking to you here now. Uh, canalization in, in genetics, where where you find uh, DNA um, who, have been, who has been separated for thousands of years. When they mix together, they find each other again. And, and that's really crazy to think of. So I'm sure something like that happened, for example, in terms of height or maybe genetic memory. Yeah. So uh, so let's see. Um, are you familiar with Songna Metal and Vindir, Kenneth? You're asking that. Yeah. You know, I did something with Songna Metal one and a half years ago. Maybe I should post that up here. Uh, I, I, I might even be able to find it here, actually. So so I'll... I'll um, uh, I actually, they, 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 um, Vreid is the name of the band who makes the metal, Songna metal. Songna is a region, uh, pretty close to where I live. I'm pointing in this direction. And, and they had this, uh, really cool, let's see now, Vreid, uh, with, um, Solstaffir, an Icelandic band. Let's see if I can get that up there. And, uh, they call it a cross. And uh, there's a new mu music uh, project. And um, uh, there it is. I'll put the link up here. I'm not sure if you'll be able to um, uh, see. 
that, that I'm I'm uh, I'm narrating uh, between the songs there, and they wanted to make it a little bit theatrical. So I, I listened to it actually not too far away, uh, no, not not too long ago. Uh, but I I think it was a little bit um, I don't know. It, it wasn't exactly uh, the way I thought it would be. And I think you can't probably see this. You can't push this, right? Uh, is is that true? Um, but anyways, you can you can check it out if you. Let me just um, go uh, vride and soul stuff here. Uh, if you, if you, let's see, go here. If you search for that on YouTube, you will be able to find uh, uh, the one hour and 30 minute long concert with me narrating uh, with some really cool, this uh, guy from Song uh, is making uh, videos in between the songs uh, where I narrate to. Uh, that's actually pretty cool. I don't like the way I talk because they want it to be so theatrical, but um, anyways, it's it's what it is. <laughs> so yeah, and um, uh, let's see. Jevnaker Haveland, good to see you. You live in Lucas, you live in Jevnaker, yeah. Oh, and you're volunteer on that Viking ship build at Sundvold. I made a video there, and I'd like to visit uh, my friend Ragnar there, who is one of the people leading the build of the Viking. It's I guess it's time for an update, how it's going. It's been, I think, a year ago since I was there last and made a video. And I'd like to hear um, your thoughts on, on what uh, videos I should make uh, on this YouTube channel. What do you want to see? And maybe if you can tell me, in the comments fields uh in the comments below or write to me if you have suggestions i'd love to hear that because i'd like to i i don't have a need to grow uh any larger on this youtube channel uh, but i'd like to make videos uh, continue making videos uh, which you guys like so if you have something like uh, Tolkien study you say Njol saga here and yeah that's a great saga maybe i should do something on the old saga uh, maybe about the women in the old saga, for example. That's uh, that's pretty interesting. Yeah. So um, uh, yeah, and Saramir. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going there, Saramir. <laughs> that's a fun comment. I'm not even gonna. Um, I, I would probably get cancelled. Um, so I'm not. I'm not. I'm not gonna go there. No, no, no. It's it's enough of that now. <laughs> uh, Marbles, you're saying auto Somali, auto Somali DNA. How related are we to modern Norwegian? Uh, are the modern Norwegians related to the Scandinavian hunter gatherers? What percentage of our DNA did we get from them? Thing is, um, a family tree DNA. The um, Swedish uh, head of the research and development living in Texas. He uh, estimates about 50% in Sweden, 48%, I think, in Norway of the modern-day Norwegians, 42% in um, Denmark. But that's from hunter-gatherers. It's a rather old model. Uh, so I've asked him to update uh, with all the new material and ancient DNA we have to see if we can have another um, percentage. But, but, you know, about half is what we know now. So talking about genetic memory, anyone who has Germanic um, uh, heritage from the Germanic tribes have quite a lot. Of course, when they went out, like in Lombardy, uh, in, in present-day Italy, the Longobards who settled there, uh, they married into the local aristocracy like the Franks did, like the Normans did. Uh, but then they would find each other, like the Longobards and the Normans in, in southern Italy would find each other and you have that conversation thing again, right? And that's probably why in this Etruscan paper that Johannes Krause uh, gave out two years ago, I think, he talks about they're, they're finding up to 20% Germanic DNA of modern-day Italians in central Italy, in central Italy. Not in Lombardia, which obviously is higher, but that's pretty much, I would say. So yeah, and um, and uh, Chris, I agree. Odin or Odin is isn't new though, and I, I don't think so either. Not at all. No, no, no. So so yeah, and uh, I like the comments you're having here, talking about height and stuff. 
the Sutton Hoe helmet was one eyed to represent Odin. Absolutely, I agree with that. And and there are some really cool and uh, smaller uh, ceremonial helmets on, um, uh, almost like shamans or something. Uh, on, on uh, really small in inscriptions. Uh, it's really, really cool. Um, all humans are hybrid species, though. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, Black Master Roshi. I mean, there's been a lot of mixing. <laughs> and, and with this new paper that came out in January with Cosimo Post um, talking about um, the uh, Paleolithic... Um, so the whole paper is sort of like a search in the Paleolithic uh, DNA. They're not calling it Western Hunt Together or Eastern Hunt Together anymore. They're calling it new uh, uh, to go deeper in what happened. And they're trying to search for what did really Eastern Hunt Together consist of a mix with Caucasian Hunt Together and ancient North Eurasian. And they're trying to really dig into it or dive into it. And I, I really like that paper. It's really cool. So a lot of things are changing now on the DNA side. And we're going to talk, I think, a lot differently on um, on all this, like Scandinavian hunt together in, in just a few years. I can see that now. So, 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 so we're getting there. Moose need long legs in deep snow, Margot. You're absolutely right. Yeah um and and james did you have a question here is there a particular gene associated with height or is that more of an environmental trait now height is 80 percent um uh, genes not pants genes I, I always say that wrong i don't know how to say it but but um but there are many genes to decide height right not like with, uh, with skin color not many genes so so yeah uh, i hope that answered your question there yeah Vindir made music of the Battle of Him right there. They did, Kevin. I, I didn't, uh, Kenneth. I didn't know that actually. So I gotta check that out. Yeah. And and um, let's see here now. Rolf, nice to see you. Hi. And and uh, um, I'm I'm you know um, I, uh, let's see now. Uh, Chris, you're writing about gigantism. It's a known effect of hibernation. Check out the ligers and tigers. Yeah, yeah, the, it's a pretty cool thing. Uh, there was this Norwegian guy 300 years ago. He was 2 meters and 27 centimeters. And he was hired into this uh, freak army by a, uh, I think, Prussian or, um, well, I think it was a Prussian um, count or, or uh, well, they didn't have kings then. But he had his own army, but he wanted really tall warriors. And, and he went up and got this Norwegian guy to come and be one of his tall warriors, sort of like to go into fighting. And and uh, I don't know what happened if he had children or something down there, but he went down there as a mercenary in, in those uh, in the Middle Ages. So yeah, there are there <laughs> it's pretty it's, it's pretty special. Uh Frank, you're asking, did Olaf Tretelvia and Inglinga Atten exist uh in Sweden? They are considered considered legends. What is your opinion? You know, I I, for, for, I mean, the clans they talk about these clans, the Ing clan. But you know, we have all these old stories, and we have so many sources of them. Uh, of course, they talked about the different families, and they would mix or not mix. Mixed. Um, the sources are full of them, so I'm, I'm I'm sure they existed. Of course, I mean, it's just just something they. Uh, I mean, you can even see that um, uh, what is obviously fiction and, and what is not, you know, if, if a, one of these writers or who made stories or poetry would write like Egil Skallagrimsson would um, work on behalf of a king, you see it's a little bit uh, subjective or, or very much subjective. So so uh, in my opinion, of course, uh, yeah. And I'm sort of like the, with Thor Heyerdahl on that side or... Uh, Torgrim Titlesta, a Norwegian historian who, who be, be, believe very strongly in the strong oral tradition that a lot of these um, uh, that existed in, in, in earlier times and that they were able to remember several centuries back uh, in detail. Um, I'm, uh, I'm certain of that. And I can only talk for myself there, but in my family, we talk about things that happened one, two, even 300 years ago. My aunt, she's 85. She can talk about that guy who was murdered 200 years ago, like it happened last year. And and so we remember, and, and I have family members uh, 
that I think about a lot actually, who, who had problems with the Danes um, uh, 400 years ago even, so and 500 years ago, uh, different people in my uh, in my own family. So so no doubt in my mind, and just to win in a court battle for your heritage, if it was real estate in the Middle Ages, you had to remember and state your family going back seven lines. You know, you can do that today. It's, it's, it's pretty cool. Yeah. So um, let's see. I, I have uh, gotten a lot of comments here now, and I hope you're talking about uh, um, different... Um, you, you're helping each other out because I'm not able to uh, answer all the questions here I see now. Gotnom Odin Sander, you found it on Danish TV. You need a Danish VPN to see that. It's the riddle about Odin. The, the riddle after Odin, I guess. Uh, Gotten om Odin in Danish. That's the TV show I was talking about. And it's really, really cool, actually. Uh, I like the eye-opening stuff. That's sort of like what I'm doing in this book uh, that I'm I was supposed to have turned in the first script yesterday. The deadline was April 1st. And I have to be honest to tell you guys that it's so interesting to write about this stuff. And I want to get it right. So I started 12,500 years ago, and I've only gotten halfway through the Bronze Age. And I have uh, lots of stuff on the Iron Age and the Viking Age and the Middle Ages and present day that has been written down. So it's not big, but 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 uh, I, I will need to spend one more, well, at least one more month. But I'm writing every day now, but it's a little bit. That's sort of why you haven't seen that many videos of me uh lately because uh i'm trying to write as fast as possible and it's um they've actually paid me a little bit of an advance so um i'm very happy for that so i hope you're happy for me there too but uh, thank you for your patience if you're waiting for more videos i want of course i want to put out more videos yeah uh mike have you been to wool in in poland uh, every year they have a viking festival you know i'd really like that I like Polish people, and I work with a Polish archaeologist on Sicily, you know, I, I talked about earlier. And I'd like to go to Poland um, more than I've been. And, and I like the enthusiasm of, of uh, Polish people. And to go to a music or metal festival in Poland, I'd like that very much. Or to a uh, the, the Viking festival. Yeah, sure. I'd like that. Absolutely. Um, and and uh, Mad Drunk Viking, you know about that festival also. That's That's cool. That's really cool, yeah. And uh, Tolkien study, you're taking a course on Viking culture. Is that um, uh, is that a good course? You think? Uh, I'm always interested in that. Yeah. So, um, uh, Monkoko, you would love to see video from the Viking ship again. Yeah, yeah. And you've been there also. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I definitely, I'm going to contact him and do something in early May uh, when I drive by there uh, next time. Absolutely. And uh, Tolkien, you subscribe to my channel. Well, thanks a lot. And have I watched the Netflix series Ragnarok? Yes, I have. And I think it's uh, uh, rather um, cool, actually. It's a it's, uh, little bit silly, of course. It's not meant to be anything than what it is. Uh, but I think it's rather cool, in a sense, because the Jotun are real people. And that's sort of like what I'm talking a little bit about in my video here on this channel. Trolls are real. So yeah, uh, that's pretty cool actually. But one TV show that you sh should see on the Netflix uh, channel uh, is uh, the Norwegian made uh, funny, not everyone likes that humor, but there is a comedy called Vikings uh, or Vikingana, uh, not the Swedish um, dance band, uh, but it's called the Vikingana. And, and uh, it's, um, you can hear it in Norwegian, they talk very, <laughs> modern uh but uh it's 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 the humor fits me very well maybe i can see if i can um leaking and i can show you uh if i have the website here uh here we are yeah maybe i can uh no no that was something completely different i'm not going to even try to show uh, just so you know i think it's on netflix if it's not please correct me um a stream on crete christ Wins over Odin would be interesting, Sarah Yeah, I agree. That's pretty cool, actually. Yeah, I, I agree. Maybe we should do that. And uh, Tolkien, you, you're asking if you've, I've seen the North Band. Oh, yeah, definitely. And uh, your professor was consult consultant on that film. Yeah. I, I made a video here on this channel uh, on the North Band, actually. And um, 
I, I talk a little bit about that because I think they, I'm very happy that they brought out, um, they, they, they illustrate a little bit of the Mannerbund, the curious, or, or I mean, the, 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 the um, men in groups together as warriors in bands, like bands of brothers or Mannerbund, as it's called, or uh, the Romans would call it Comitatus, when the Germanic tribes would, would sort of like, it's a great dishonor when you protect the Lord. If you die after the Lord dies, it's a great dishonor. So, so you, you can't die. You have to die before uh, your Lord. But um, that, that Comitatus thing is actually part of the Northman. They also do a lot of uh, trance. Uh, but it's, I, I, I know uh, another one who's been a consultant uh, there, and, and I think he's rather, he's rather woke. I won't say his name. <laughs> but... Um, I, I, I think they're also, they're not uh, making it into a really, really cool thing. They're actually more a little bit ridiculing that uh, macho uh, comitatus uh, warrior bands. Um, so I, what I talk about in the video is that I don't like it that they're ridiculing it. Because I sort of, but, but it's cool that they have it. So we can see it for what it is and decide for ourselves. That's... That's my take on it anyways, uh, Tolkien study. Um, old fashioned Euro, the origin of the Germanic in Scandinavia, nothing to do with Germany. That was something Celtic. Uh, all right, uh, we can agree to disagree on that one. I made some videos on that. If you want to see the secrets of the Germanic tribes here on this channel, and, and we can, uh, we, sure, write to me, we can talk about it. Um, <clears throat> Andy, hi Andy. Uh, you're interested to know what I thought of uh, Survive the Jives video on the Northman. You know, I haven't seen it, um, so maybe I should check it out. Uh, I, I, I don't have that much time to see so many YouTube videos. I did watch uh, Chris Canford, uh, John White, he made a video where he talked a little bit about the origin myths of um, the start of the Bible. Uh, I think that was yesterday or two days ago. It's, it's very much relatable to what I'm writing about in the book. At, the, at this moment. So uh, I did watch that video uh, today uh, while I was uh, writing <laughs> and, and it's quite intriguing. Uh, so that's something to recommend anyways. Yeah, uh, but I'll, I'll check it out. Absolutely. Jetter, uh, Jettun, uh, Söderun. Yeah, I see you talking there. Oh, um, uh, Matt, Matt, I guess. Do we have any subclades of I1 related to the Longobard migration? I see some Z one for one, but they look like they migrated from Germany, not Scandinavia. Well, well, yeah, I, th I think um, it was Patrick Geary who did a couple of studies on on um, on the Longobards, both in Hungary, I think, some graves there, and in northern Italy. But you know, he didn't do a lot of uh, skeletons, not so many men. Uh, so I'd like to see more of that. Uh, we don't have that much, no. Uh, and, and it's not all I1, of course. Uh, it was a mix, as we talked about, both R1B and R1A and, R, R and maybe even some N1 and C uh, of these uh, Y haplogroups, Y DNA haplogroups. But uh, yeah, sure, I, I'd like to see more of that. Absolutely. Uh, my pleasure, Marbles. Thanks, you're writing here, I see. And, and Squeeze Cloud, there were some Indo European related people found near China that were very tall. Same with some old Native American tribes. Yeah, you know. Um, Gravettian inland, Western hunter-gatherers were also tall and had light skin for, for Western hunter-gatherers. Yeah, I, I'm glad you like that. Uh, you, you write that. Uh, Gravettian is quite interesting. In the new paper I mentioned in January um, on the Gravettian culture, they didn't find any connection between Gravettians and ancient North Eurasians. And that kind of surprised me a little bit. And what you're talking about um, in the European related people, um, that's of course before the Indo Europeans, uh, what you're talking about there in, in uh, uh, Native American tribes. Uh, but you do find uh, some ancient North Eurasian, um, really early on in the Americas, uh, who are connected to the Yamnaya, later Yamnaya warrior and the Eastern hunter gatherers. And it's a Tolshian, I think it's called, these mummies in uh, present day China. And uh, I remember when I first heard about them. Many, many years ago, they, they talked about them being Caucasian and not Chinese looking. And it was, uh, it seemed like for many years, the Chinese researchers didn't want to do DNA on them. Uh, but then I had this investor who helped me 
20 years ago on some of these research uh, expeditions, uh, scientific expeditions I went on. And, and one of these investors had a daughter who used to travel a lot with Tor Heyerdahl, the Norwegian explorer, uh, who sailed the Contiki in the Pacific. And, and she actually were able to pay, I think she paid off someone, I don't know, this is like 30 years, 20 years ago or something. Uh, and she was able to come to China because she had contacts there and, and to meet the scientists who were working on them. And, and she, it was really funny because when these researchers who were working on the mummies that you mentioned there, Squeeze Cloud, when they saw her, she looked exactly like one of these skeletons that they were working on exactly the face and the hair and everything and they 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 fell to the ground laughing because they couldn't believe it <laughs> imagine that and that's pretty funny and uh, uh maybe we should check our dna actually that would be a nice thought because now we have the dna results on those to charian thanks uh trim bucket to charian that's what i meant yeah uh it's interesting that the ASCR are asian and the inherit yeah yeah i tell it the hun yeah, I talked a little bit about that. I'm I'm trying to. Hey, Michael, thanks a lot. Uh, I see you're adding. Um, you're you're actually supporting me here, buying me a coffee. Thanks a lot. Uh, do you know of any Chatti tribe artifacts? You know, I'd like to um, dive into that a little bit. Yeah, the Chatti is quite interesting. Uh, no, I, I well, I'm sure I've seen them. I can't come to think of anyone right now, but the Chatti. They were really, really interesting. Uh, they are really, really interesting now um, to 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 work on and, and study. So that that would be cool, absolutely. Uh, thanks, Chris. I'm a breath of fresh air. <laughs> um, yeah, and and uh, let's see here now. Um, trolls are real. Thanks, James. Oh, I talked about this a while back. I see. I'm a little bit late on all the comments here now, and I have some other things to show you here um let's see i'll i'll try to here we go um frisian frisians are interesting uh blocka adelaide uh, because uh, they've sort of kept like a germanic tribe to themselves uh but they were so during the um, early merovingian period they were very influential and important as traders bed a, a the monk bear they wrote about uh, the, uh, England being populated by the Germanic tribes. Uh, he wrote about th three tribes, the Utes from Jutland, of course, and the Angles from Jutland and the Saxons from present day Germany. Um, but of course, the Frisians were there also. Do you see that on DNA? And, and everywhere there's been trade and the Frisians were sort of like right in it because for the Carolingians and the Merovingians, the Franks, I mean, Frankish Empire, the Anglo-Saxons were very important trade-wise, right? So, so the Frisians are very, 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 very interesting um, uh, in many, many aspects in, in history, yeah. Uh, you're calling Tolkien a breath of fresh air, not, but me as well. Okay, thanks, Chris. <laughs> that's uh, that's fun, funny, yeah. Te te terrorized. Hey, I'm looking so young. It's the haircut. Well, maybe it's the haircut or the lighting. Maybe it's the spring, actually. So I'm feeling sort of like um, relieved to have uh, survived yet another winter. Yeah. Um, so I had some questions uh, from uh, first Kenneth. You, you looking forward to hear about my plans and some new research and and um uh, was wondering uh and it was nice to see that burial uh that i had on uh, on here uh, before the um, live stream started this photo of uh, there are several photos actually they did, uh, they did some some reenactment people did the viking burials i i uh, there were some cool ones of women being buried but they they, they lay a little bit modern and they and he wrote the one who took the photos they didn't think too much about it but uh i wanted to post the women of a woman who was buried but uh really it, it looked a little bit too much reenactment so i'm happy with the one photo that was there um margo you have asked up front here do you have any information on the new Viking Hall archaeological site in Hune, Denmark? And yes, I do, actually. 
and and I'll show you uh, because I think more people would be interested in seeing this. Um, let's see, I'm getting it up now, and uh, maybe I can just show you a little bit here now of the different. Um, I will. Uh, whoop. Uh, let's see now. Yeah, I. Um, let's see. Here we are. Okay, Margot, let's see here now. Um, the news in the Viking world. Let's see if we can do something about that now. In Denmark, north in Denmark, they did. Um, here we go. Can you see this? Archaeology. Uh, arch 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 Sorry about that. Archaeologists in Denmark have unearthed a 10th century Viking hole deemed to be the largest discovery of its kind in a decade. And, and this is up north in Denmark. It's kind of cool because as I'm showing you here now in the photos, you can see the immense size here. But this was a part of a Danish history attributed to Harald Bluetooth, Bluetooth guy. Uh, and he set up ring forts uh, really protective and really cool uh, Viking ring forts, even one in close to Oslo in Norway, actually. Uh, let's see if you can get a good, uh, maybe I can get that also a good, here we are, some shapes of these uh, forts, how they looked. And, and um, they were uh, perfectly built and, and easy to defend, I guess, uh, or uh, they had stationed uh, people there. So, so yeah, I think that's um, uh, pretty cool to think of um, this, this new finding. And uh, there's a Facebook page called Nur Yuske Museer. Maybe I will uh, also uh, put that one up there also. So you can you can go on that web page and they, they have actually quite a lot of updates from uh, what they're working on there. Nordjysk, um, that means North Ut, Jutland, uh, and, and museums. So you can see that up there also. And and, and Margot, you asked also about, um, they, were, they did find something in Oslo. I can show you that also, uh, which was rather cool. In um, uh, they're digging a lot in Oslo these days, and they're finding a lot of old uh, stuff here. In the, there's this web page called Archaeology in Oslo. It's in um, Norwegian, unfortunately, but I'll, I'll tell you here. They have removed forty thousand tons of mud, and suddenly they 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 find um, uh, things from the from the Viking Age. And and some and, and they're trying they're right now they're doing analysis to see exactly from when it is, but they find uh walls and uh lots of other uh interesting stuff that's uh probably um or or um they're searching. Let's see if I can uh find this also. Uh they're 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 doing a lot of interesting stuff now that we might be able to um well, make some new discoveries, especially this Niku that I showed you. This is their web page, Niku. I think it's also in English. Let's see if we can. Yeah, here we are. Using GPR to shed light uh, on state formation, national unification, and religious change in Norway. They're doing a lot of interesting stuff up north in Norway. This is around the area of Trondheim. And you can see here from the Photos, aerial photos. You can uh, let's see if I can do this. Yeah, I think I can. Here you can see the. Uh, this is from, I think it is Stiklusta, the huge Viking battle for uh, Christianity with uh, Saint Olaf the Holy, where he lost his life, and you can see uh, boat shaped graves, and you can see circles there and uh, pits where they found coal, and this is not Stiklusta I see because uh, there were more. Uh, but they also have triangles, uh, which was also a way to bury. So, so that's uh, that's rather cool. Uh, and they're doing a lot of this uh, new research now. It's um, I think it's amazing because there's so much going on now. It's it's really 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 <laughs> cool. Not just with DNA, but they're doing so many other stuff. Like uh, I can show you here also on the um, uh, remains of a 1600 year old house. In out, just outside of Oslo, let me see here where they're um, working. I can uh, translate to you here now. Um, 
I have to go. Uh, let's see here now. Yeah, here they're doing all this uh, digging. There's, this is just a dig, I guess, but they're finding a a, um, a house here, which is uh, in Opsal outside of Oslo, and they're 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 actually able to do a lot of uh, cool stuff now. And we can follow this on on Facebook. And I love how many of these archaeologists now are using uh, both uh, well social media, I guess. Uh, to show the progress of their work because what i'm used to before is that they keep their hands really close to the chest uh, as we say or the the cards really close to the chest i guess and 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 here is another one in oslo from the viking age uh that they find uh, in the city while they're digging right so they're doing uh this is a burial viking burial from the viking age uh in the middle of oslo actually so, so yeah, there's a lot of stuff going on, and it's rather cool, um, which I think is uh, awesome because uh, right now there's uh, so much going on that I think um, uh, will. I think the pace now is much higher in in stuff that's being found in in DNA papers uh, that are coming out. It's uh, almost hard to keep track, and and it's uh, I I love it because it's 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 bustling uh, in a sense, uh, and it's a good time to uh, write a book, for example, that uh, the book can be fairly quickly uh, outdated, even right, like this this new DNA paper that came in in uh, January, where uh, researchers basically say, hey, we're not going to say Eastern Hunter Gatherer anymore. We're going to use other terms for it. <laughs> Yeah. Hey, uh, there are some uh, I ones here. The Teutonic warrior. Hello, and uh, and the, the ring forts look like Celtic force, uh, forts. Yeah, that's cool. And there's an I one in Mercia. Oh, that's cool. And and also in Sweden. Oh, Vardalnia, you're on there. We see. Yeah. So um, the I one is is rather special. Yeah, because it's uh, in this DNA paper I just talked about from January. They connect the I-1 with Western hunter-gatherers, but not the I-2, who started early with the farming and largely disappeared, even though they were plentiful in present-day Poland and the Baltics and maybe even in Scandinavia. But a lot of I-1, oh, sorry, a lot of I-2 men disappeared in, in Northern Europe. It's sort of like a mystery what happened there. And the I-1, if you remember from this preprint uh, last year from Allentoft, Martin Allentoft, um, where they talk about the Neolithic, they they see that, uh, they speculate that I-1, we know I, the I-1 men went through this, what we call a bottleneck genetically, meaning they were very they reduced to very few people. Some have even speculated that it was only one man at a certain point in time. That's really crazy to think about. But what? But I, I don't know. Well, it sounds a little bit crazy. But what we do see in correspondence with both the funnel beakers, whom I call the Vanir, meeting the Acid, who are the warriors, the Amnaya, uh, before the Nordic Bronze Age in the Neolithic times, when they clashed together and suddenly made peace. Uh, just like it says in Wollespo, uh, by the way. And and you had the Jotuns further north, of course, who were the Scandinavian hunter-gatherers. But when they mixed, then, and that's what this Allentoff paper last year, the preprint says, then I1 exploded uh, together with R1A, R1B, and N1C probably also uh, after uh, another 2,000 years when the N1C people came in. But the thing is, uh, it exploded, and, and, and that's really crazy. And it says in the paper that anywhere where the Germanic tribes uh, settled, you find I1. Of course, you find R1B and R1 too also, but you find I1. And considering how few there were, before the Nordic Bronze Age, it's kind of it's, it's quite crazy, and I'm talking about this since I'm I uh, I want to yeah, <laughs> so um, it's rather interesting what happened there. Something go, went on, and 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 we'll know more about that. I'm sure in two years, maybe. I'm patient. Yeah, so um, let's see now. <clears throat> oh yeah, and I forgot. Oh man, 
I should have something for my throat. But I'm thinking about finishing off now. Um, and if you have some questions or comments, or if you want to buy me a coffee, even, <laughs> this is new today. For those of you who haven't heard that, uh, I, 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 someone told me I should do that instead of just having my patron channel. Uh, but if you um, didn't get to, if you arrived late and didn't get to see my skiing video from yesterday, feeling the nature, <clears throat> being close to the fertility cult site and the mountain above it, yesterday, I put that up on my patron channel so you can go in and check it there if you want to. And um, and uh, uh, James, you're asking any more info on Volo? No, not yet. Oh man, that's bugging me. It's really stalling. Um, yeah, so we got to do something more on Volo. I agree totally, absolutely. But um, I hope you enjoyed this. It was nice to talk with you and and meet some of you I see here for the first time. And uh, I'm glad you got to chat some among your uh, yourself also since I wasn't able to answer all the questions here, but um, it's very enjoyable to spend time together with you, even on a Sunday evening, which it is here in uh, Norway. And um, I'll um, say good night to you from the fjords of Western Norway. And tomorrow morning, I'll wake up really early with the birds outside, I, I'm very fortunate my house is a little bit isolated, so I have trees all around, which is always a good thing. That means also in the springtime there are happy birds at 6 o'clock in the morning, and I'll get up then and I'll continue writing on this book, and I'll be sure to work on an English translation of 12,000 years of Scandinavian history. I hope you'll enjoy that. So, uh, good night. Tschüss. And uh, thanks uh, to everyone here who says skål and uh, take care and thank you. Uh, please do take care of yourselves and I hope the weekend has been well and I wish you a great April and good coming week. All right. Take care and uh, thanks everyone.